Yep. Lord knows what will happen now. Jim's the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I'm hoping, I think everybody can see my screen. Yes. Okay, um, I, don't know, I don't know how many people we have that are inventor gurus or people that have used Inventor in the past. Um, right now I'm using 2015, which is the version that PLTW had originally recommended. Um, I can tell you that 16 has a lot more memory um, requirements. So 15 is what we decided to do, but when you download your HSM, you're actually going to download HSM 2016. The way that Autodesk did it, which was really nice for us, is they've made it backwards compatible, I think all the way back to 2013. So 13, 14, 15, 16, they will all use HSM 2016. It's really just a plug-in. Um, the majority of like my IED students, uh, I, I want, we're really using kind of a cheap computer right now, and this computer is not really designed to use Inventor, or let alone Inventor and HSM. Um, so if I'm on my Tools tab, uh, over here where it says Add-ins, once you have installed HSM, um, you will see that Inventor HSM is one of the ones that can be turned on and turned off. So like for my IED students, we for the most part, all these ones that you see, um, the frame analysis, tube and pipe, cable, harness, a good majority of these things we turn off. Um, so I can just click on one of them and I can say uncheck this load automatically and then it just won't load the next time Inventor loads and Inventor will load a little bit faster and it doesn't have all this stuff kind of running in the background that makes it run slower. Next big part that I, I'm not a huge fan of and I don't know why they did this is you can no longer see hard edges. Um, so if I came over here and I asked this to look at it from the front, uh, everything is going to disappear. I, I can't see anything, especially when I'm doing my cam work. That's, that's really no good for me. I, I don't need to see the shaded edges and all that kind of stuff, making it look nice and neat and pretty. Um, so this, where it says view and the visual style, the majority of the time I want this shaded with edges turned on. And once I do that, it brings on all my hard edges. I get to see all the edges where the fillets and everything are. And then no matter how I look at the parts, everything will be there. So that's one thing that you may want to suggest your students to do. And if you want, um, Chris and I, we can throw a quick video together. You can actually turn that on permanently. Uh, so that's on all the time. Um, and my students, that's one of the things I suggest that they do. Uh, another thing, if you're a big Inventor user, is if you come in and make a new sketch now on anything, it used to automatically outline it. So you would right now be seeing this yellow outline all the way around all of my surfaces, which uh, I've been using Inventor for quite a long time, and I don't see the benefit for it not to be there. So I just want to spend a second to kind of tell you where that all is. And since Chris is doing this as a video, you'll kind of have it anyways. On the tools, the same place where I got the add-ins, I had this application options. And that's where I can mess with all of these things, like assembly. Um, if I want, where is it at? Um, place and ground the first component at the origin. If you have that check mark, it'll bring that back. Um, sketch, if you bring back auto project edges for sketch creation, if you check mark that, it'll bring that back. Uh, if I go to display, settings, I can make that shaded with edges a default. So you can kind of decide what you would like this to look like. The bad part is I've never found a way to make this permanent for every student's computer when I do the install. So unfortunately, this is unique for each user. So as soon as a student moves to another computer, all this stuff undoes itself. Um, unfortunately, I've got my settings done, and when I shoot a lot of videos now, mine is doing things that other people's aren't doing. So I just want you to kind of be aware of that. When Chris and I made the videos this summer, auto project edges, all of that stuff is already turned on, um, and yours probably is not going to be doing that by default. So I just wanted to kind of let you know that my settings may be just a hair different than yours. Okay? All right, so we don't need that. All right. So welcome to this is the GDF, the uh, Garsh Darn Flange or the Giga Drive Defragulating something or other, Fratistat, whatnot. Um, this is all the students that used to get. You can actually get this from the curriculum. You could pass it out to your students if you were kind of tight on time. Um, 
I want mine to fabricate them, and I want them to think about the origin and those types of things. I'll tell you, if you're a Mastercam user, or Edgecam, any of those other CAM packages, being able to draw this now wherever I want instead of drawing it on the origin, HSM is really user-friendly for being able to manipulate the part and its environment for people that drew them wrong, for people that really don't even know CAM. Um, HSM is pretty user-friendly to just kind of hop in and fix your own mistakes. Um, so, that's, you've already seen, I've gone from my 3D model, I'm going over to my CAM tab, and my first process for my students is always to click on this tool isometric icon. Uh, as soon as I do that, it will then reinterpret the part, and it will flip it over the way that it's going to sit inside the machine. So my X is now across the front, my Y is now here, my Z is here, but that really doesn't even mean anything. I can reassign all of that. I can flip it over, I can have a hole on the bottom of it, and I can make Inventor interpret that. So this is all, all pretty easy once you kind of figure out some of the basics. Okay? So the tool isometric will make it sit like it sits in your vise. Step two is going to be to come to our setup folder and teach it how it's actually sitting, um, teach it what my stock is, and get ready to then decide some tooling and some strategies. So I'll come to the Setup tab, and I go get a sandwich and come back, and there it goes. Okay, so once I'm here, uh, I've got three tabs. This last tab, we're not going to do anything with it at all. So I kind of just go through with my students. There's a couple of them that we're going to mess with, and a couple of them we're going to be able to leave the defaults. The bad part about Inventor, Inventor will always reset itself back to the defaults unless you teach it not to. Um, this is not a learning software where it will start interpreting your likes and dislikes and your preferences and those kinds of things. This software doesn't work that way. Um, so unless you physically go in and reassign the defaults, it will change them back every single time. Like, um, it's always going to start off on milling. Uh, if I want turning, I can change it to turning. I usually leave that one alone because I don't do any turning. Um, you can also see if you hover over things, not everything has a little um, icon to it or a little explanation, but the majority of their things do. All right, so the WCS is what they call their origin system. So it's trying to interpret how the part is sitting and where 000 is. So I have a bunch of options, and if you click on it and you hover over the first one, it will kind of give you a, here's what they are and here's why you might want to choose any of these. I can pick model orientation because I drew it that way. Later on, that might not necessarily be true. So Z is up, X positive is here, Y positive is here. Um, I can just leave that option, which is the default. Um, if I want to change my origin, I can then change that. I can actually say, do it off of my modeled origin uh, because that's the way I drew it. So when I extruded it, I extruded it into the negative direction. It's all right, but it's not that big a deal. If you want to change it to a different place, then I can say stock point. I can pick that point, and I'm done. So I have all of these center points, all these midpoints, all these corners. I can, I can assign any of them however I want. Okay, so that's the first tab. The first tab is just making sure that your work <coughs> your work coordinate system is sitting in the correct orientation and that you have assigned where your origin is. Any questions so far? Silence is good. All right, so next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say stock. And what you can see right now is my stock is this yellow. Um, fixed size box, relative size box. I can't very well do from solid right now because then it interprets all of this area as my stock is already missing those things. Um, right now, I'm just going to do a fixed size box, um, or I'll do a relative. Either one of these is going to work. So if I say relative size box, just be very careful because it will always, by default, add 40 thousandths of an inch in the, in the Z. So it thinks I want to come in here um, with a facing operation and clean off 40 thousandths of an inch to make that top flat. Okay, So I can actually erase that. Um, if you don't want to keep remembering that, it's always going to keep adding that. 
Um, you can also say no additional stock, and it doesn't matter what's there. It will take all that away. Um, and you can also right-click in a box, and you can reassign defaults. You can also reset it back to what it was from the factory. Okay, so if I did have that um, add additional stock and that 40 thousandths was there, I could say don't ever add that 40 thousandths again, leave that alone, or do whatever your whatever your lab does. If you always want to have 40, 50 thousandths in each one of the directions, X, Y, Z, you can reassign those to be whatever you like. So I'm going to say don't add any. So relative size to what I drew and don't add anything extra. And again, I don't ever do anything to this tab. So what did I do here? I made sure it was sitting right. I made sure it was on the corner that I wanted. And I made sure that the stock was interpreting correctly from what I drew. So that's really all I had to do. And it tells you down here that it's a 3 by 2 by 2 So that's good. Okay, I now say OK. And as soon as I do, I now have a setup folder. And sure enough, I can come back in and I can edit this anytime I want. Okay, until I actually post the code. Um, once I post the code, it will actually export the code out of Inventor. Then it becomes separate from Inventor. I can keep changing things all day long, and it will keep reinterpreting until I generate code. So, Jim, let's suppose, for instance, a student wants to go in and change PRZ to the opposite corner. How would you go and do that? Uh, so I come in here, and the easiest way is to do that stock box point. Mm -hmm. And if I wanted it over here, I just click over there and say OK. And what do you do with the X and the Y, like if you want the X and the Y going in different directions? So if I want them in different directions, I come back to here and I change that model orientation to I want to select the Z axis, select the X axis, select the X, select the Y, select the X and Y, and it will reassign them. So if I wanted to stick, um, so this is going to be my Z and that's going to be my X, um, then I can reassign them. Got Oops, it. I got it. You have to do them. That's the only thing I don't like is once I click one, I would think it would then hop to the next one like it does in all the other inventor things. Right. And once I pick my parts, but it does, so Z, if I wanted that to be my Z, I then have to come over here and say, right now I want the X, and then I can flip them. So I can flip the X to go the other way. I can flip the Z to go the other way. So redefining it is fairly fairly intuitive as long as you kind of understand how it's going to sit in your vice. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Okay, any other questions so far? I think I just saw a tumbleweed go by. All right. <laughs> so we now have the part. We have assigned our work system. We have assigned our stock, and now we're ready to start doing the rest of it. And I think a lot of this has to do with your preferences. Um, I look at the part right now. This is the largest area that needs to be removed. Um, from my experience doing milling, that is also the most stressful on the machine. That's almost the most stressful on the vise. That's the most force is trying to pull the part out of the vise. I usually try to do my large areas first and then start whittling into my little things. Um, that's going to be my biggest tool, so I like to try to do a lot of that ahead of time. Um, I've got options. Right now, I could figure out this radius. Um, so if I inspect the part and I go to measure, I could click on that and it tells me that it is a quarter inch radius. Okay, so as I'm picking my tools here in a minute, if I picked a half inch diameter, that gives me a quarter inch radius and it could just go to the corner. So it just comes straight over, straight down, straight over, and it would give me that radius as it just heads into the corner. If I pick anything smaller than that, then it will just decide to do an arc as it gets into the corner. So it will come over and then it will do a G02 or G03 depending on whether I'm going clockwise or counterclockwise. So I can do this really with any tool that is a half inch diameter or smaller. Anything larger than a half an inch just won't get that radius. It'll do the best that it can. Um, it just won't be able to produce exactly what I'm looking for. So that's the kind of stuff that I want my students to be able to decide. So now if I'm really thinking about this, okay, I could do this with a half an inch, but I could not do this with a half an inch. 
Um, I could not do this with a half an inch. This is an eighth of an inch here. This is a quarter of an inch here. That's a half an inch there. So I could do this whole thing with an eighth of an inch. So eighth of an inch could come around here and do this slot. Eighth of an inch could come in here and hollow out that. Eighth of an inch could go back and forth. But man, an eighth of an inch would really take forever to hollow that entire thing out. But now you get to play a math game. You get to really think about, all right, so what would be my time that I save by changing tools? How much faster can I make this part if I hogged all this out with a half inch? And then I change to a quarter inch to do this. And then I change to an eighth of an inch to do that. But how long does it take to change the tools? Does my machine have an automatic tool changer or do I have to manually change the tools? That's some of the things I want my students to start being able to try to determine. So um, the way I'm going to do it right now is I'm going to do this with a 3 8 tool. The reason I'm picking a 3 8 tool right now is many of you that have the Benchmill 6000 or the Pro Mill 8000, the 3 8 tool is the largest shank tool that you can use. So this was originally designed uh, around a half inch tool. You, you can't. Your machine, the largest tool available to you is a 3 8 of an inch tool. So that's what I'm going to attack that area with. So now you have 2D adaptive and 2D pocket and it's going to clear that out for me. Um, I'm not going to go heavily into it. This is fairly new for me, is this adaptive theory. Um, you can kind of look at the picture there. It has to do with corner engagement. Um, the way Chris and I were taught a long, long time ago is everything was a 50% step over. So you think about how you cut the grass. Most of us, we take the wheel from the lawnmower and we cut one stripe, and then the next time we put that wheel in the last wheel's path and we cut the next stripe and so on. Um, for us, that's a lot. What we typically do is we would take our lawnmower and step over 50% of whatever my diameter is each time. When you enter a corner, you're actually getting more than 50%. You're actually getting 50% in two different directions. So that's this 2D pocketing. That's just stepping over exactly what you want, normal concentric loops like you would cut your grass. This adaptive is some kind of smart technology which actually goes in and tries to find the least stressful way for the tool to actually go into the part. So this is supposed to be the way everything is going. This is um, a smart milling. It actually kind of makes a strange pass. It really kind of goes all over the place. In some areas it actually kind of whittles it away. It takes it away in small little chomps and some areas it will take away big. Um, I just don't know tons about that 2D adaptive yet. I know it works. I've sent it to the mill, so code-wise that doesn't change. Um, do I know that it's really saving me time and tooling? I don't know those answers yet. I haven't done a lot of that enough to know any of those answers. But you can use either one of these. They're both going to work. But since 2D Pocket's what I'm most familiar with, that's the one I'm going to go with. It's just nice, even concentric loops. Okay, so as I open it up, unfortunately, you're looking at tons of tabs um, and tons of options. This is the one thing about HSM that I'm not a huge fan of. The big thing is you kind of have to know a little bit more about what you're doing. When I was in EdgeCam, EdgeCam hid the majority of the things that the majority of us didn't know about nor care about. Um, you could always go in and edit those things if you wanted, but HSM, they're all kind of here. So unfortunately, you're going to have to kind of pick and weed out through the things that you care about and then the things that you don't. So it's in order. The very first thing I want is a tool. So I'll pick my tool, and I already have my library installed. Um, Chris and I on our website have a tool store for you. Um, it just happens to be this tool store. Um, so 3 8 in mil is the one that I'm going to use. And I'm going to go ahead and say select. And it should then auto-populate all this information for me. Um, Autodesk was nice enough to embed those as defaults into our tool. So once they helped us make that tool library, um, as soon as I pick that tool library, it will automatically pick some of these. And these are things, these are settings that will work pretty well for all of our machines. Um, the pro whites, the super pro whites probably could run a little bit faster. The experts, the benchmen, these numbers are decent to at least start with. 
um, 18 inches per minute for cutting. Um, we should be plunging at nine. We're at a spindle speed of about 3,000 RPMs. So I shouldn't have to mess with any of these if you pick one of our tools. If you pick any of their tools, these numbers are going to be all over the place because it doesn't know what material this is. And I would think Inventor would be smart enough if I came up and said that this thing is going to be aluminum, that it would start setting these numbers up. Uh, apparently it's not. So unless you know the chip load and everything for aluminum, unless you know some of these things, I would just pick our tools, especially if you're using rin shape or wax. Okay, so I have a tool pick. I'm going to come to the pocket selection, and I want the bottom of that pocket. So that has not only defined the boundaries of it, it's also defined some heights, which I can deal with here in a second. So the first thing I want is to define that as a pocket. Um, I'm going to leave all the rest of these alone for right now. Heights, I don't typically mess with clearance. I don't typically mess with retract. I don't mess with feed. These two that are open right now are the ones that I mess with. Stock top is the fine for my top height. So it has interpreted that the pocket starts at the top of my stock. That's not necessarily always true, but for that pocket it is. Um, you've got a couple different options. Um, bottom height, it just happened to be that I selected a contour a minute ago. So it thinks that that bottom height is based off of what I picked, but I could come in here and I could pick it as however I wanted. Um, I could even say stock top and I could offset that down when I wanted. That's the bad thing about this to me, is there's so many different ways to get the exact same answer. Um, I do want that selection, and it's down there. Okay, so I just need to make sure that that blue line is set up at the bottom of that pocket. And it has actually measured it for me right there, and it says bottom is negative 0.375 from stock top which that's correct. So if I was looking at my print right now, it tells me that that's 3 to an inch from the top. Okay, I'll now come to my passes, and I am not a big fan of this two sets of defaults. One of them is this stock to leave. I get the gist. They want to leave 20 thousandths of an inch um, across the bottom and 20 thousandths of an inch across the sides for me to come back in and clean those up. By default right now, I don't want to leave those, not on a regular basis for the kind of prototyping that we're doing. If I was doing real machining, fine. Um, Ren and wax and butterboard, not so much. I don't know of a way to change this default. I can change numbers. I can come in here, I can change that number, and I can make that the new default. Um, I can edit expressions, and if it's a constant, it'll be a constant. If it's a formula, it'll be a formula. But I can't change a default for a radio button. So I can't make that not be there. That's just something my students have to learn every time is to come in and take that stock to leave off. The next thing I wish I could turn this radio button on by default. Um, whatever HSM's theory is, they think I'm going to go to the basement in one shot. So whether I'm going to helix or rampant, I'm going to go all the way down negative three-eighths of an inch, and then I'm just going to hog it out. That, in my opinion, is not necessarily a great strategy um, to start teaching students. That's, that's a lot of material. That's a lot of stress on your machines is to take three-eighths of an inch diameter bit and plunge down three-eighths of an inch into the part. That's a lot of stress on your machine. So if I open that box up, I want to try to change this. And right now, I would like this to be half of whatever my tool diameter is. So. 50% of my tool diameter, my tool diameter is 3 eighths of an inch, half of that is 3 sixteenths. So I want my maximum roughing step down to be 0.1875. And again, I, I can really kind of do whatever numbers I want. That just happens to be a number that I'm comfortable with. Um, I know my machine is able to do, it's not going to be that stressful on it, but it's going to take multiple steps to be able to get down to that bottom and it is more time consuming. Um, Finished step downs, I have zero there. I could leave a very final one so that the very last pass was a nice smooth pass. Um, but if you leave zero finished step downs, then it doesn't matter what number you leave here. It's not going to do anything anyway. Um, use even step downs. You can use that, and it will recalculate that out and try to break it up into even ones. There's a bunch of things there. 
but I want this multiple depths. I want it to be about half of whatever my tool is, and I want to get rid of that stock to leave. I'll come here to the very last one, and I'll pretty much leave it alone. Um, I don't mess with the majority of these. There are tons of things. There are a couple of these that we'll have to mess with here in a little bit, but for the majority of you, I'm going to leave these alone. All right, so what I do, I pick my tool, I picked the pockets, I made sure that the top and the bottom were correct, I got rid of stock to leave, and I set up my multiple depths, and I left everything else alone. I do want to climb mill this um, anytime I really have a good choice to be able to do that. Uh, oh, last thing, right here, this maximum step over. This is doing it right only because I've already set the default in this software. So right now, that .1875 is because of me. Um, when I taught my students last week, I already set one of my defaults. Theirs, and I, I don't know their rationale, their rationale is they're supposed to step over 90%. Um, 90% is a loss, unless I'm using some kind of carbide tools or something. 90% to me is a ton. So I did edit the expression, and theirs used to say 0.9 right there. So I got rid of that 0.9, and I put in a 0.5. So that was one thing that I did change. I got rid of that maximum step over. Every software that I've used up until now, this has always been a percentage, not a number. I've always been able to say this is 50%, 20%, 10%, whatever it is that I want, and it's always calculated it. For some reason, HSM shows me a, a raw number. Here's the formula, blah, 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 something, something. I don't have a bull end mill, so it doesn't matter. Times half the diameter, blah, blah, blah. If you put get rid of the 0.9 and put in the 0.5, and then you say set that as your default, then you won't ever have to mess with it. Okay, that's why mine right now says 0.1875 because it interpreted it off of this tool. Okay, and then I did nothing here. So I say okay, and it should come over and it should show me some tool pass. So I see the red arrow tells me where it's going to plunge into the material. It's then going to helix down 3 sixteenths of an inch. It's going to cut that loop. It's going to helix down another 3 sixteenths, cut that loop, 3 sixteenths, cut that loop, and then retract out of that point. Okay. So, and I know we're going through a lot of this fairly fast, but you learn a lot, I think, from the videos that we've put together to where this is going to start making more sense. Okay. Do we have any questions? And good. Chris, are you at least still with me? I'm still here. Okay, good. All right, so I'm going to simulate, and I just found a problem with this um, last week. When I come into simulate, the first thing I want to do is turn on this stock, and it should then turn green. There it is. And when I hit play, it should play through it. And then at the very bottom, I should have show a part comparison. That, to me, is essential. A part comparison will show me what did it do that it was not supposed to do, what did it not do that it was supposed to do, and what did it do right. Um, I must have a really cruddy computer because it crashed. It wouldn't do it. Um, the part flashed and it just turned gray and it showed me the inventor file. That, that doesn't, doesn't do me any good. Um, so I'll show you here in a minute that if this happens on your computers, a setting that we were able to change to make this do what it was supposed to do. Okay, so right now I'm going to leave it off and I'm just going to hit play. It'll go through. It's going to do that little helix, and then it's going to come over, and it's going to cut that pocket. And then it's going to do it again, and then it's going to cut that pocket. So 3 sixteenths of an inch each time until it's hollowed that area out, 3 eighths of an inch down. Okay? This little bar down here will allow you to speed it up. Um, so I can jump back to the beginning, and now I can hit play, and it's going to go faster. And I can also kind of jump through it. There's a couple different things that you can do down here with this little play box. All right, so um, we'll play it blah, 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 all the way through. Then I'll hit this show part comparison. And if I do that, you should interpret the part. Everything in blue right now, it didn't do. Everything in brown is correct. And um, let's, let's lie to it. Let's accidentally forget to uncheck that box. And now we will simulate it. 
hopefully it doesn't make a liar out of me, and I will show you that, oh, I don't want, okay. So it'll go through, it won't show the part comparison until the very end, it will interpret the part, and you'll see that very fine blue line all the way along there, and on the bottom of that surface is all blue, that's that 20 thousandths of an inch that's my fault, I forgot to get rid of, or I need to go back and get rid of later. Okay, um, so let me show you, mine did not do this. Mine would not show this. Every single computer in the room, um, both my teacher station um, and my student station, since they're two different kinds of computers, neither one of them would work. Um, so I, it's, we've already been here before. The tool application options. This time I'm going to go to the hardware tab. It's this box down here we had to check. Um, use for systems with unrecognized graphics hardware. It may be when they install my computers, they may not even have the right drivers for my graphic cards. Uh, but I have an onboard card, so it probably is a junky card anyways. Regardless, as soon as I check that box, then my uh, comparison started working again. If I don't have that checked, um, actually I think I have to shut the software and reopen the software to make it do it. All right, we'll give it a try. I think you have to close the software to get it to, yeah, so it's working right now. So as soon as I close the software and reopen it, it would not show a part comparison, which I don't want to do that. That's bad. So give me that back. Okay, so we've got our first thing done. We're now ready to go ahead and go to the next one. I know I cannot do this with the 3 eighths of an inch. I know I cannot do this with the 3 eighths of an inch. So this, I'm going to inspect. Um, this is a quarter of an inch diameter. And this here, from here to here, is an eighth of an inch. Okay, so um, yes, I could hollow that out with a roughing operation. I would rather drill it. I want to come in, I want to drill those holes. So I'm going to drill, and I want my library, I want my quarter inch flat. I want to pick my whole faces. There, and there, and there. You can also, um, let's get out of that. I can also say select same diameter. I can pick one of them, and it will go pick all of the other ones for me. Uh, I don't usually mess with this order by depth, optimize order. I leave all that by its defaults. Um, you do have other options, select points. I just use that one by default. This one, the whole top is fine, whole bottom is fine. I leave those alone. And then you have a whole series of a whole bunch of junk that you can do. Um, drilling, counter boring, chip breaking, blah, 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 reaming, tapping, probe, blah, blah. So I'm just going to drill it. Okay, and I say okay, and that's done. So I can come here to simulate. I'll go ahead and hit my play button, and you're going to see that there's going to be an error. So I'm going to play, and it's only drilling the holes. And my students were smart enough this year to figure out, oh, it's because of what you had selected. Yes, if whatever you have selected is what it will simulate. If you wanted to simulate the entire thing, you pick the setup, and then it will simulate the pockets and the holes. So now it'll go through and try to do the entire sequence. So fast forward. And then I lock my computer up. Yeah, it's a it's a sweet piece of HP. So I get that all completely done. That's all fine. Um, oh, I still have the blue there, but I don't have blue in those pockets. For some reason, a minute ago it had blue, but it has gone away. So as long as it goes away, um, apparently some amoxicillin will fix anything. So I will go ahead and get rid of stock to leave. Goodbye. All right, very last thing I need to do is I need to go ahead and trace this path here. There are a bunch of different ways to do it. Um, you have slots where you can pick an outside wall and an inside wall, and it will figure out the difference between them. Um, you have 2D contouring, which will allow you to pick either the inside wall or the outside wall and make it race around it. Um, there's a couple different options that you have. Um, let's contour it. Okay, so I'll contour it. I'll go pick my tool 
and I want the eighth inch flat. Select the contours. Again, I can either pick this one or this one. Um, so either going to go outside this one or inside this one. I don't care about that one. I need to make sure I have this set up right, and I want to check this bottom height, which right now it's not set up right, so I need to be able to pick the bottom of that. Oops. Bottom of that. Select. I want a selection, and I'm going to select that. So now it knows the bottom. It says that's a quarter inch down, blah, blah, blah. Um, top, socket top, that's fine. Here, that's unchecked. Multiple depths. 0.0625, half of whatever my diameter is. Everything else I think is fine. Everything else except these is going to end up being fine. So I'll say OK. Actually, it's going to do it OK. Um, let's we'll zoom in on that. Nope, that's not going to be OK. So the problem is these points, um, HSM does not like to plunge. HSM is coming down and it's rolling into the part. Uh, well, the bit that I chose is perfectly the same diameter of that. If it comes down, I'm going to simulate this here in a minute, and you're going to see that it's going to leave me something here uh, that's not good. So we'll go ahead and we'll simulate that. And I'm going to not simulate the whole thing. I'm going to do just that 2D contour. So everything is turned on. We'll go ahead and hit play. And you see that little gray right there. That is an area that it's crashing. It's taking away something that it was not supposed to because the tool keeps coming into this red area and actually chewing away an area that it's not supposed to. Okay, so I need to eliminate that. It's just something that apparently they have decided strategy-wise tools aren't supposed to do. Tools aren't supposed to just plunge straight into a groove or anything like that. Um, slot, I think, if I remember right, takes care of that problem. But um, I can also get rid of this lead in, lead out, lead entry. I can get rid of these, and it will stop um, that radius right there. So if I get rid of that, and I get rid of that, and then I say OK, this time you should now see those lines go right on top of each other and straight through there instead of giving me that little extra cut that I didn't want. Okay, so that's what I was saying. You, you kind of have to know a little bit more about this software than you have to know about some of the others. There's some of those options you kind of have to know what they mean and what they're doing. And that should finish the entire part. So I can now simulate that. Oops, that's not the whole part. Come on. There we go. I am back. Oh, you're back. Yeah, it, well, it's not quite back yet, but I'm back anyway. <laughs> that's, well, that's, that's what I was trying to warn. Uh, a lot of people this summer that were all jumping to grab the two th 2016. Um, 2016 doesn't necessarily like to play well with any of the computers. Um, it's just like Windows 10 doesn't necessarily play well with a lot of the computers. So um, you kind of have to be a little bit leery about always needing to have the biggest, baddest, best on the market because sometimes it's not all it's cracked up to be. Um, Project Lead the Way says, you know, that they stay with, for the classroom, like for this year we're using 2015 even though 2016 is out. Next year they suggest that you go to 2016 and 2017 will be out. So it's not a bad idea to stay one um, level back because then you're using something tried and true. Some, let, let somebody else do all the trial and error for you. Well, and you also look at when Autodesk releases each one of their versions. By the time Autodesk has released their version, your school needs to have already had your images and everything made. So by Project Lead the Way always staying a year in the rear, that's actually good for me because I can have my people making the image right now. And they can be you know, troubleshooting it, figuring out what works, what doesn't work, before I have to go in day one and nothing works. So the last thing I wanted to show, um, I want to show making a change. Okay, so here's the big problem. 
kids go back to the 3D model, um, and I can go back to the 3D model as much as I want, but this doesn't change. Once I'm in CAM, this is now CAM. So I can come up to the word CAM, and I can go back to model, and it will bring back everything that's in my browser bar. So what I want to do is I want to make a change. Um, I'm going to make, I'm just going to make the pocket change. So it may still be not liking what I did to it earlier. Oh. <laughs> well, at least it happened here in front of my students. Oh, that's not right. Um, so I come into here and I'll make that 0.375. It should then change those four fillets. All right, so the big deal is now that has been changed. Once that's changed and I go back to the CAM tab, the CAM tab will recognize that, but it will not do anything with that information. So if I come in here and I go back to CAM, all of these now have red X's on them. But you didn't change the drill. You didn't change the 2D contours. That's not the way it interprets things. It sees it as an entire set of strategies. So if there's something wrong with this top one, as far as it's concerned, there's something wrong with everyone after that. So this is all you have to do. You just have to open it and close it. As soon as you do that, it will reinterpret it and it will refigure it out. Um, you can also right-click on it and you can... Um, there's one that is... I thought there was supposed to be one. There's a regenerate. Unless they took it away. Just, there was one that said regenerate. Would just generate toolpath fix it? I guess it does. It used to say regenerate. So yeah, just click on it and generate toolpath. And it'll go back. And all it's doing is reinterpreting the part and figuring out if there's anything it needs to do to be able to... Uh, reinterpret that specific piece of geometry. So anytime you see the red X, it usually means something has been altered about the geometry, and you just need to teach it that it's okay to reevaluate where the toolpaths are going to go. Otherwise, the toolpaths won't move. They'll be just the way they were. Okay, so all said and done. Like I said, I can change the orders. I can drag and drop that. Um, now it will drill and then pocket. I can drag and drop that. I can change tools. Um, so I can make some of these use the same tool, the same quarter inch one that I drilled with. I could then make it pocket width. So I could come in here and ask it to use the same tool to do this pocket. It's just going to take more passes. But it saves me a tool change. Um, so all said and done, I come to this post process. And when I go to post process, I can now decide what post I want, and I right now want my IntelliTech post, and I do not want the IntelliTech post that comes with HSM. Uh, it has errors in it, and it has more than one error in it. So if I go to this IntelliTech PLTW, this is the one that's on Chris and I's site. If I choose that one, and I hit uh, leave everything else alone, I hit post, it will generate my code. So it figures out everything that needs to happen to be able to do all of those. And I'll save it. A question. Here. Yes. Um, so you've got your your own tool, um, your own set of tools that we can load in, and this uh -huh. post process we can load in. That's all on your website, right? Yep. Um, my school currently, although they said they're going to remove it, have a program on called Deep Freeze which wipes the hard drive of any changes made every night. So is that something we're going to have to just load in every single time we use this program unless they remove that deep freeze? Um, or if it was installed before they put deep freeze in it, or if they install it. So if you have okay. one of your tech people come in, anything that they do behind the scenes, it doesn't right. have to do. Yeah. Right, so right, okay. they have to come in. So if they come in and they install those, they, they just get dropped into a folder. As soon as you drop those two in a folder, as long as they do it behind the deep freeze wall, then every okay. day it will remove. Now, that's the problem, I think, with Inventor. So if you change the defaults, I bet yours won't uh -huh. change. Right. 
because it's per user anyways, and I don't think yours is saving any user settings. Yeah, well, they said they're going to remove it, and they said they're going to start with my classroom because I'm having the most issues with uh, just how long it takes to boot up computers and everything. So yes, yeah. I guess they feel like they don't need it anymore, and they said, well, once we remove it, we can save individual student settings, and then the computers should boot faster. And I'm like, that sounds awesome, but I don't know when they're doing it. So the really cool thing is now that I look at all this code, um, now you can really start talking to students about when can I remove zeros, when can I not remove zeros, what does modal truly mean, um, I's and J's. So if I look here, um, I see a G3, which we know is a G03, and then there's nothing, no code, no code, no code. That's yeah, because the G03 is a modal code. That F9 is modal. So once it's 9, it thinks all of these are F9. I don't want that. I don't know why it decided that it was going to do a feed rate of 9 in an arc. I guarantee it was a setting somewhere. One of those boxes that I didn't check that said slow down in arcs or something like that. But I can now, now that I know how to edit code, now, that's what we weren't teaching the kids. We weren't teaching the kids how to write code. We were teaching them how to read code. Now that I know what that F9 stands for, I can go ahead and change that to an F18 and boom, 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 all the way through. Um, really where it plunged was, oh, this is a helix. That's why it's doing it as an F9. So this is that helix. That All that blue right there is it making that spiral. So then it goes into F18 because there's Z values in here. So here's the neg. So it, it did all of these arcs up until that point. It was never even touching the material, up to two thousandths of an inch above the material. But you're also going to see tons of code that you don't know what are, um, like a G17. Um, I'm sure I'm going to see more of them at the, actually, um, no, that's not, that's not that bad. When you start getting into fancier codes, you're going to see other codes in here that don't make any sense. Canceling flatlands and canceling can cycles, and most of the time we don't have to worry about them. Yeah, it's a good exercise, too. A kid will look at his code and he'll say, hey, I've got a G17. What's that? Well, I don't know. Go figure it out. And they'll have to go look it up and they'll see what it is. And then you can. it leads into a discussion for you know what it is. It works on our machine. We don't really need to worry about it, but it's there. And this and there, the cycle macros, they all say them over here. So if I come over here to G17, it's an XY plane specification. Some mills you have to, especially the five axis mills, you have to tell it where the XY plane is. Well, that, So you have G18, you have G19, and so on. The G17 is what we would normally use. And our machines, the Intellitech machines, that's the only plane that it can use. So G17 is just set into it by default. So you'll see there's a whole bunch of codes here that you could inevitably end up seeing. Uh, we just don't necessarily have to worry about them. So ideas, once you, know, once you look at this, I can probably knock this part out in you know, 10 minutes. So coming through, figuring out what my tools are going to be and going through this. You know, so we took you know, 35 minutes or so to do that. But once you start kind of learning the software, um, the hardest part is deciding what tool I'm going to use and what strategy I'm going to use. There's, there's a bunch of different options. I could use these 3D millings. Each one of them has got a reason. There's a rationale on why I would try to use it. Um, this is when I start getting to things fancier. Like for my students, uh, if I go back to the 3D model, not only do they have to do that, they then have to flip the part over and get it to machine that. So this is a two-part. They're doing something on the bottom, and then they're going to set up a second setup, which you can do. So if you come into your CAM tab, I can now do multiple setups where I can tell it you know, where this is going to be. And yes, now I need to flip that over. I need to decide that my, let's do X and Z. So this is my X, this is my Z, but I need to flip the Z. So that's how that part's going to be now, and now I have two setups. And when I post my code, it's going to post it out into two separate codes. So I've got the one side of the part, I've got the other side of the part. So they're going to do a surface operation here to create that area there. Um, 
I'm going to make them do a facing operation first, clean that off so they get a nice flat surface in here. So they'll do, they'll actually add to their stock. So they'll come here to their stock and they're going to add to it. Um, relative size box and top offset, they're going to add four thousandths of an inch. So they'll do a quick facing operation once they've got that. Then they're going to come in here and they're going to they're going to pick the strategy, but probably scallop it, and they'll clean that top off. But that's what I want them to learn from all the different videos. Generate toolpaths all. Oh, if I'm on this setup, does it do it? Generate toolpaths all. Well, apparently it will. It'll go back and it'll recycle through them all, depending on what setup you have highlighted. So, <clears throat> well, we're at 5 o'clock. Um, if anybody's got questions, we can hang around. We can answer any questions. If you don't have any questions, we're done. All right, thanks.